Hey everyone, and welcome back to Installation 00. And thank you to every single one of you who have subscribed and stuck with this channel for the past five years. There's now 200,000 of you who have joined me on this greatest of journeys. I actually just got done re-watching what I did around the 100,000 subscriber mark when I got the YouTube plaque up the back there. I remember it was only a couple of weeks after that that I revealed that I was going to be taking Project Mjolnir on and actually trying to design a real-life functioning suit of Mjolnir. And, and it's really odd to think that around two and a bit years later, I've got the first fully functional working prototype Mjolnir helmet in existence, made of metal. It's just all of this, all of this, the channel, everything I do is only possible because of you. Because of all of you who have decided that you wanted to join me on this journey. Which is pretty insane. Really insane. <laughs> For me at least, from my perspective. It's strange to think that it took pushing three years to get to 100,000 subscribers. It was about two years to get from um, from zero to 50,000. And then about three years to get to 100,000. And only two years later, I'm at 200,000. In fact, we're a bit past that now. And that's... It's real. <laughs> it's, it's real. If I could... If I could go back, so to speak, to the 11-year-old kid who picked up the controller in a game, in a, in a game video game store, and played parts of the Silent Cartographer from Halo C back in 2000 and, 2001, early, early 2002. If I could go back to that guy, to that kid, and say. 20 years this this game will be your life you'll be a content creator it'll be your full-time job to make content on the law of this awesome universe that will only grow there's no chance in hell i would have I believed myself that my 11 year old self would have believed me but i also feel like i did that 11 year old proud which is I didn't expect this. <clears throat> I didn't expect this. It's been I'm gonna leave this in. I need to leave this in. It's been um It's been difficult. Not just not not the, not this part, you know, the, the YouTube channel, but life. Life's been difficult. Everyone's life's been difficult. And um, to be in this privileged position is. You, well, you guys know you've you've been with me long enough now. You know that I'm I'm pretty articulate. I'm good with words, and um, I'm capable of of articulating and expressing what I need to what I need to say with relative ease. And every single time I I think about how many of you there are and this this community that we've built together and and the channel and how it's grown and. I just, I lose all all ability to articulate myself clearly and concisely. Um, like I said, everyone's had their struggles in life. And, you know, I'm, I, I, as I said in my 100,000 subscriber reveal, I'm no different from anyone else. I've had my, my trials and tribulations. And um, to find myself in this privileged position, position because of you guys, because of you wanting to support the channel and, and watching and liking and subs 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 subscribing. See? 
um, because of you, I, I've I've been blessed with the life that I've got now, and and I've I can only thank I can only thank you, and I, even that feels like it falls short. Just saying thank you doesn't feel like enough of a payment to you guys for what you've done for me. So, yeah, I wasn't expecting to get like this. <laughs> I was expecting just to quit this off quick and have, and have it have it done. <sighs> I'm so proud of the of the community that is assembled behind me, and the awesome things that we have achieved together over these years. And I assure I assure you, I'm in this for the long haul. We've had a tough time for Halo recently. It's a really tough time. Um. Some of the games have landed on bum notes. Campaign support for Infinite was pulled, and and now they've got past the um, the hiring ban, so to speak, at Microsoft, and they're perhaps starting to bring new people back in. Maybe there's a glimmer of hope on the horizon that something's coming. But there's no two ways about it. We've had it tough, really tough as a Halo community, and and that shows in the pain that I see. And the and the frustration and the anger that people have, um, and the acid and the venom that they that they spit back and forth between each other within the community, it's it's a symptom of a frustration that we are all carrying that that we're that, that we've been forced into this situation, and we've had it tough. There's no two ways about it, and um, and that also shows in the you know you consider many of the content creators even. Uh, that were around just a couple of years ago have since kind of left and moved on to other things again showing that, th that things are struggling you know people are struggling but I want to I want to assure you all of you that I'm in this for the long haul I'm not going anywhere Halo's had its troubles recently but it's still deeply deeply connected to my heart and and I'm still deeply passionate about it I'm not going anywhere I'm going to continue to deliver the best most detailed lore I am capable of for your enjoyment because that's ultimately why you're here not for me to sit here and ramble and and get freaking emotional on camera you're here for some good hard lore and I'm pleased to say I've got exactly that in store for you after this I have tons of plans for the continued evolution of this channel. I've got a few things in mind where you know things are going to change up a little bit. I'm going to bring some new things online. Some old things are coming back. Um, and I've also got things planned for the other three channels as well that I that I also host here on YouTube. The links that to those can be found on the on my channel page. So yeah, five years, half a decade, and two hundred thousand of you, over two hundred thousand of you, are now are now following me and I, I can't even picture that what would that look like to have nearly a quarter of a million people stood in front of me as my audience <laughs> insane and I, I again I just I thank every single one of you from the bottom of my heart for sticking with me through the good and the bad that we've had over these five years and I hope that you continue to walk by my side long into the future because as I said I ain't going anywhere anyway thank you with that all out of the way I'm finally going to deliver to you what I promised a good long while ago now the 200,000 subscriber special the largest video project that I've ever undertaken and the largest script I've ever written the most detailed breakdown of installation zero zero my esteemed subscribers i give you the arc
the Ark. Installation 00. An extra galactic megastructure of Fauna design and the origin and command point of the Halo Array. An utterly unique facility that is equal parts awe inspiring and deeply terrifying. Both exquisitely beautiful and yet harboring the darkest of purposes. Its verdant surface, deep blue waters, and captivating skies with truly breathtaking vistas and an unparalleled view of the Milky Way galaxy itself are all but a superficial shell that hides its purpose of setting into motion a galaxy-wide cleansing of all sentient life. Seemingly just with the press of a button, an entire galaxy of life can be extinguished. The Ark appears almost seamlessly self-sufficient and effortless in its form and function. Yet a structure of its scale, magnitude, beauty and sheer power do not come without a significant, nearly insurmountable level of technological sophistication to back it up. The purpose of today's video is to shed light on the deepest mysteries of the Ark, to look at every piece of known data on this megastructure, to present as much extraneous detail as humanly possible to thoroughly flesh out this pristine and glorious structure. We will look at every shred of law, every piece of data, every environment, every story surrounding the Ark to give it a video breakdown worthy of the title of most detailed. The video will be chapter marked for your ease of watching and to allow you to skip around should you desire, either in this watch or in future watches should you revisit. In order to write this video I referenced in-game lore, direct gameplay, campaign story and multiplayer lore from all relevant Halo games, game manuals, lore drops, logs, the Halo encyclopedia, the Halo novels, Halopedia, Halo Waypoint, cut content and dozens of external sources to add substance to this video, so be prepared for a wealth of information unparalleled on this platform. With all that said, the portal is open and it's time to give the Ark the most detailed breakdown. The Ark was first constructed at some point between 98,445 and 97,445 BCE or before Common Era. The material that was used to build the Ark was likely harvested from several planetoids, as was the case for the Halos that were fabricated from the raw materials of the planetoid in the hub of the Ark itself. The raw materials would have been strip mined and processed by Fauna Sentinels changing their mechanical and material properties to suit the requirements of the main foundational materials of such a megastructure. Although it is still unknown exactly what processes are performed to this raw material, one can infer, given the foreigner's extremely sophisticated and advanced technological achievement, such an exquisite control over gravity in the form of artificial gravity, this can be employed for materials creations. The periodic table is somewhat universal so you'd expect the materials properties not to vary much, until you consider the influence of gravity and what that does to density. As with neutron stars, the material at their core is so dense that a single teaspoon of that material would weigh around 10 million tons. The foreigners would not need to achieve anything close to this density, but manufacturing any materials in a higher gravity environment would have a noticeable effect on the density and thus material properties of the artificially produced material. This gravity field would have the effect of making each individual atom of the molten metal ten, hundreds or even thousands of times as 
quote unquote heavy as they are normally. Obviously the atoms themselves would resist being crushed together under gravity to a degree up to a point but under a high enough gravity gradient even these forces can give way. This would mean that the atoms would be crushed closer and closer together and as long as it doesn't bridge the gap between ultra compressed and fusion the result after cooling is a material that is hyper dense. Even hydrogen, an element we're most familiar with as being gaseous in form, when compressed by gravity enough, becomes metallic in nature. Indeed, with enough heat and pressure, you can turn carbon, a brittle, metallic, black and flaky substance, into diamond, a hard, clear, optically perfect material. Diamonds are rated at 10 on the Mohs hardness scale, indeed actually the defining mineral of the Mohs hardness scale, but are still basically just perfectly ordered and highly pressured carbon matrices. In theory, the foreigners could do the same with practically any other material on the periodic table. If carbon can be ordered and pressured to render it the very definition of hardness in our current understanding of materials properties, there is nothing to say other elements wouldn't go through a similar process. The foreigners could hypothetically do the same thing with other materials resulting in ultra dense materials. Consider the fact that foreigners did make extensive use of osmium, which is a metal that has a blue gray tint. It is very hard but quite brittle, that remains lustrous even at high temperatures. It has a very low compressibility and its bulk modulus rivals that of diamond at 462 gigapascals. It is moderately hard at 7 on the Mohs hardness scale and has a very high melting point at over 3000 degrees Celsius. It is also an element that would be found quite readily in asteroids across the cosmos as it is a transition metal found as trace elements in platinum ores despite being the rarest of precious metals. If osmium constitutes a key material in the creation of foreigner megastructures it is no surprise that the arc and indeed the halos themselves seem to defy the laws of physics in their materials properties. But this isn't where the impressive technological innovations end for the overall superstructure of the arc. In its final constructed state, the arc measures 127,530 kilometers or 79,243 miles in diameter with eight arms, four larger and four smaller arranged radially around a central hub, like the spokes of a great wheel or indeed the petals of a flower. In the middle of the hub is a void measuring just over 10,000 kilometers in diameter within which the halo installations could be constructed, harvesting the raw materials from a planetoid held stationary in its center. Most foreigner megastructures also possess hard light reinforcement to stabilize and protect them against tidal and gravitational forces from other objects. In our current understanding of hard light, photons, individual particles of light, are emitted and then slowed in a dense cloud of opposing particles. This causes the photon's speed to be a hundred thousand times slower than in a vacuum. At this critical stage, at least given our current technological understanding and temperatures approaching absolute zero, the photons lose energy and gain mass, likely due to the relationship between mass and energy as defined in Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equations. The fact that photons, normally massless particles, suddenly gain mass causes them to begin to react to one another and begin to form particle bonds with other photons. In high enough concentrations, this begins to manifest as a solid material made of low energy 
high mass photons. This is useful in that the process enables energy to be converted into light and then converted into matter, which, as long as a power supply is maintained, provides a near infinite supply of matter, limited only by the system's efficiency and photon density. The ultra-dense foundational materials of the arc are engineered in such a way to facilitate an exotic mechanism known to the foreigners as hard light bonding. This is basically where energy channels are created in, around and throughout the foundational material allowing hard light to flow and take form, providing a hard light reinforcement to the structure. Due to the possibility of power loss, hard light is never relied upon for the most important structural systems, as a power loss could result in a catastrophic failure of the structural integrity of the system. So, conventional ultra-dense matter is the desired foundational structure, although many forerunner structures project a hard light decorative shell over the structural support elements of the building, almost all buildings seen on the Halo installations or the Ark lack this covering. The foreigners did not implement such decorations on the Halo structures as they were meant to be purely functional. In this regard, the same could be said for the Ark, although it is, of course, still at least marginally possible that there are such structures built into the Ark, but are just inactive unless in the presence of a foreigner or at least an individual with the know-how to activate them. It is unknown if the Ark was constructed within the galaxy and then moved to its final position some 260,000 light years outside of the galaxy, or, as is much more likely, was constructed at its final position, with numerous planetoids being moved to its location through slip space for their raw materials. This is much more likely because the location and indeed the existence of the Ark was unknown to practically all foreigners during the height of the Fauna Flood War. Building it within the galaxy would have drawn a lot of attention and risked it being captured by the Flood. In addition to this, with slip space rapidly becoming more and more latent to the point of unusable, having to then move the Ark through slip space to its final position would be extraordinarily difficult, or entirely impossible. It seems much more likely smaller planetoids were moved to its construction site than the other way around. The structures seen on the surface of the installation are built as part of the underlying structure, with the terrain then printed on top of them, creating both the individual conditions required to foster the plethora of flora and fauna within the myriad biomes and refugia, and the appearance of an actual structure seemingly built into the surrounding landscape when in fact the landscape was added after the structures. The arc is divided into the hub and its eight respective arms, four larger and four smaller, all of which are further subdivided into distinct environments known as refugia. These refugia hold within them the unique environmental conditions, terrain, atmospheres and even gravity as that of the inhabiting species' homeworlds. The refugia are quite obvious and distinct when looking at the Ark as a whole, separated by immense metallic walls and boundaries. However, each of these are subdivided again by smaller, less noticeable walls and boundaries, and can be subdivided still further by energy barriers that can be custom projected and adjusted whenever and wherever necessary. The hub of the Ark is divided as follows. There are eight larger core refugia, each numbered with a unique three-digit binary identifier. Core refugia 000, 001, 010, 011, 100, 101, 110, and 111 are immediately obvious from orbit above the arc. There is likely a foreigner designation for the refugia spires or the arms of the arc, but they are currently unknown, so for the purpose of explanation, I will use the UNSC designation for these. 
In addition to the eight larger core refugia, there are four refugia wedges, bringing the total number of greater core refugia to 12 for the hub. These core refugia wedges are named after the respective greater arm they lay at the foot of, alpha, gamma, epsilon, and eta for the respective greater arms. Again, all of these refugia are subdivided by physical walls and boundaries and can be subdivided again with energy barrier refugia. The radial arms of the arc are known as the refugia spires, with four greater refugia spires and four lesser refugia spires. Each spire is named radially after Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta and theta, respectively, with alpha, gamma, epsilon and eta being that of the greater refugia spires and beta, delta, zeta and theta being that of the lesser refugia spires. Each of the spires are subdivided into three higher order spire refugia, with each of these subdivided by walls and boundaries and subdivided once more via energy barrier refugia. This totals 24 higher order spire refugia, bringing the total number of larger refugia to 36, with likely hundreds of physical subdivisions and innumerable energy barrier subdivisions, with every single one capable of containing, sustaining and housing unique environments, gravity, temperatures, terrain, weather, atmosphere, ecology, flora and fauna, and thus facilitating the life worker functionality of the Ark in being able to be a safe refuge and catalogue of sentient species in the galaxy for reseed following an array activation. At the very central hub of the Ark, the builder functionality of the Ark is fully facilitated by the immense forges and foundries used to create new and replacement halo rings using the raw materials harvested from the planetoid parked at its centre. Orbiting high above the Ark is a unidirectional artificial sun. The sun itself is cradled by an immense fauna construct that not only sustains the artificial sun, but also creates an immense and deep shadow that allows the Ark's surface to experience something akin to a day-night cycle of approximately 35.3 hours, although this is entirely adjustable based on how fast the artificial sun orbits the installation. It is also hypothetically possible that this armed construct also serves additional purposes, including collecting and then converting and transmitting the excess energy produced by the star to the arc to supplement its power requirements, and may also be unidirectional in nature to make it extremely difficult to spot by sentient species within the galaxy using astro-observation technologies such as telescopes to spot the peculiar position and movement of the star. The unobstructed direct light emitted from an artificial sun would likely be immensely more detectable from within the galaxy than the softer reflected light from the surface of the arc. It is also entirely possible that the artificial sun's fires are further sustained and supported by harmonic resonance platforms hidden deep within the clouds of the arc, and perhaps even serve as a reciprocal energy harvesting platform. While the terrain of the Ark may appear to be naturally formed at first glance, it is actually artificially constructed. Strato Sentinels extract raw materials from the source, process them in transit, and deposit building materials at the installation. An intricate layer of metallic panels is laid down several meters below the surface of the terrain, upon which rock, soil, and eventually vegetation is added. In order for the massive landscape foundational plates to serve their function, they are held in place by superstructural connections and interim anti-gravity fields, as the actual landscape of the Ark was not an original feature of its design, but rather an innovative addition insisted upon by the librarian. The anti-grav fields and sparse superstructural connections allowed the honeycomb structure of the Ark to support the additional landscape without adversely affecting the core functionality of the superstructure. Massive terraforming factories would then move across the face of the arc to skin it with land masses and bodies of water. 
These factories would also hold the arc's nitrogen oxygen atmosphere, which is then leaked out of the surface, eventually pouring through the superstructure and tugged in place by artificial gravity generators. Energy barriers and massive walls lining the sides of the arc prevent the atmosphere from leaking out into space. The result? Towering mountain ranges, enormous canyons, Vast swathes of desert terrain occupy their interiors, comprised of a rich intermingling of ecosystems, and while appearing natural in their formation, they are anything but, often only being a skin no more than a few meters deep. Some features, such as landslides, are even the result of time and have been formed quote-unquote naturally by the arc's inclement weather. The arc achieves its gravity through artificial gravity generators. Due to this, the various refugia present on the installation surface may have different surface gravity, terrain, lighting, and atmospheric conditions to facilitate the respective flora and fauna of those refugia, with the specific environmental conditions of their respective home worlds. The interesting thing about the weather systems of the Ark is that while they were initially implemented as an artificial construct, once in place and due in part to the arc's immense scale, they follow the basic laws of meteorology. The atmosphere begins to react to the arc's size, geography, topology, temperature gradients, orbit of the artificial sun, as well as its own mass and inevitably starts to react to these variables, leading into a positive feedback loop, increasing in its own instance of chaos theory and settling into a naturally governed cycle that then outwardly appears completely natural, even to the analysis of smart AI such as Cortana. And ultimately, this is fundamentally the case. The atmosphere, while created alongside the landscape, still follow the basic laws of physics. When you then add in the varying different conditions, each contained within their respective refugia, the immense complexity of the arc's environmental systems move from being breathtaking to quite simply mind-boggling. The Ark is an immense megastructure with a level of technical sophistication which quite simply boggles the mind. It is unsurprising then that the Ark requires dozens of high-level facilities to allow its overarching functions and key operative capabilities to be served. It is worth noting here that these facilities have secondary and tertiary redundancies, sophisticated compartmentalization and fluid systems development methods that allow the respective functions of the innumerable facilities to be relocated or offloaded to other facilities in the event the primary one is compromised. The Ark, like many other installations, houses a cartographer which contains the complete real-time record and schematics of the installation, including its inner passages and networks to be used as a navigational reference for traversing the installation. The cartographer is a dedicated fauna facility designed to contain and provide access to a program responsible for mapping the entire structure and all of its key areas of interest and ever deepening layers of technical and logistic information to enable the user an instant and above all accurate map and guide to any location on the arc. A central component of any installation of fauna construction, it is found on nearly all of their megastructures, such as the Halo Array, the Shield Worlds, and in this case, the Ark. Some installations even contain a number of discrete cartographer facilities, known as silent cartographers. When activated, a cartographer provides a real-time holographic map which can be used to navigate the massive expanse that is an installation, along with other relevant information, such as pinpointing every room or location within the vast structure. The cartographer facilities on the various foreigner installations differ in layout and design, though the primary map rooms on the Halo installations are buried within large structures, housing a network of compartments and rooms. Due to their significance, the cartographers are protected by multiple security measures. An artificial intelligence is able to interface with the silent cartographer and, for example, set navigation points on the holographic projection. A foreigner armor's personal ancilla, 
was able to link with the cartographer and provide packets of information on the installation's past activities directly to the wearer's brain. One of the ARC's cartographer sites was visited by both UNSC and Sangheili forces under the guidance of 343 Guilty Spark in 2552. This one was an immensely large monolithic fauna structure overhanging a sheer drop-off from a body of water. Within this structure, a labyrinthine network of rooms and corridors all led eventually to the cartographer room, a multi-story cavernous space with huge holographic projectors capable of displaying a real-time holographic representation of the Ark, well over a hundred feet in diameter. Another of the Ark's cartographers, which was radically different in layout and design from the one originally visited in 2552, was utilised by banished forces during their occupation of the Ark in 2559 and was eventually taken over by the crew of the Spirit of Fire. The only other known and visited cartographer site on the Ark was that of the Epsilon Spire cartographer, which was utilised by the Keepers of the One Freedom, again in 2559. Since this cartographer exists on one of the spires, it stands to reason that every single spire has its own separate cartographer, with its own secondary and tertiary redundant systems, leading to the possibility that there are at least nine primary cartographers, up to 18 secondary silent cartographers, and dozens of tertiary cartographers. Construct is located within the same fauna structure that houses the cartographer, positioned significantly below the cartographer chamber, where John 117 fought Sethagus at the end of their time in the cartographer facility. One of the primary features of Construct are two powerful energy beams. These beams are seemingly conduits of immensely powerful but passive energy displacement, so strong in fact as to actually have some degree of gravimetric effect if an individual stands in the beams. While the beam doesn't hurt the individual, it does somewhat displace local gravity, allowing the individual to travel up the beam's length, akin to an anti-gravity lift. These beams likely feed directly up through the ceiling of the construct area and into the base of the cartographer, thereby imparting immense energy into the cartographer itself. This beam may also be responsible for carrying the immense quantities of data that is required to allow the cartographer to give a real-time readout of all locations across the entire facility. How and why these energy beams are seemingly passive and do not cause injury if intersected is yet another mystery that the foreigners have yet to reveal. A control room is a crucial facility featured on many fauna installations, most prominently those on the Halo Array. The control rooms contain the installation's core data center and is used to manage the entirety of the installation's systems, including any primary weapons which can be activated by inserting the activation index into the core, or even disabled given sufficient expertise. The core is the most indispensable part of any fauna megastructure or installation. It directs and controls every other aspect of the facility's innumerable functions and is the location that the rings may be activated by way of the activation index in respect to the halos, and where critical systems, data and protocols can be accessed, altered or activated in the case of the ARC. Containment protocols dictate that the index must be physically brought into contact with the core by a reclaimer. According to 343 Gui Spark, he was not allowed to perform this action, although not that he couldn't and the Jurulhane chieftain Tartarus was seemingly unable to do so. Once the index has been reunified with the core, the installation's firing sequence begins. However, if the index is forcibly removed before the firing sequence, all seven halo rings go into standby mode, ready to be fired remotely from the arc. When this happens, any activation of the halos or their functions that would be operated by the control room is moved instantly to the citadel on the arc. The citadel being a location of contingency, only becoming active in the very event that the halo array moves into standby status. While many believe the citadel is the control room of the Ark, this is in fact untrue. The Ark possesses several facilities, known as Clarion facilities, that serve the function of control rooms. 
The Citadel is just one of many, and one that's primary purpose is that of the firing of the Halo Array. Other functions include the management of the installation's safety protocols, and control over the installation's gravity anchors, enabling the ejection of selected environmental sections into space. Control rooms are featured on other installations as well. Shield worlds, for example, possess dedicated control centers for the fauna fleets or weapons that they may contain. These critical operational areas of the Ark are being identified and studied to maintain UNSC control and understanding of this critical installation. These specialist-only XCG teams are escorted and protected by assigned, highly trained Spartan operatives, such as Spartan Fletcher. The Citadel is a vast structure seated at the precipice of the Ark's core, with one end suspending precariously over the emptiness below. The Citadel is protected by an impervious energy barrier controlled by three separate barrier generator towers, and access to the basin in which the Citadel is seated is gained via a very large and very thick security door next to the third tower. These barrier towers are structures used to generate protective energy barriers around locations of importance. The three surrounding the Citadel project an energy shield that denies access to the Citadel Basin. They could be individually deactivated by means of a holographic control panel on their upper floors, but it requires all three to be deactivated to cause the barrier to fall completely. If even one is left online, the barrier remains operational. This triple key access and the logistical distance between the three allows a heightened level of security and increases the odds that an invalid attempt to access the Citadel can be denied and prevented due to the time involved in access and deactivation of the three. Like other foreigner architecture, the towers can be built on a variety of landscapes as demonstrated by the key differences in the towers on Installation 00. The first tower encountered is set in a very small valley and has an access tunnel that penetrates directly through rock. The second tower is built directly into a cliffside and has no entrance other than the ones that led directly into the central room, and the final barrier tower was shown to be situated on a small plot of land with ramps that either vehicles or infantry could traverse. Although, as we know from the terraforming of the Ark, these facilities were likely in place before the landscapes were even skinned onto the surface so it's less like these towers can be built on a variety of landscapes, and more than a variety of landscapes can be built around them. The towers on Installation 00 also have an observation platform jutting out from the top. Within the control room, there is a large glass window that overlooks the citadel, surrounded by a semicircular formation of the towers. Terminals were also shown to be put inside, and the shield that the towers projected was shown to be strong enough to absorb plasma torpedoes fired from a CAS-class assault carrier. The environment of the basin is a cold, icy tundra a world away from the temperate, deciduous forest environment on the other side. The entry to the citadel is a ramp and energy bridge, leading to a small antechamber at the opposite end of which is an elevator leading to the main hall of the citadel. The main hall's interior is a long chamber, with the entrance gravity lift at one end and the control centre situated on the far end overhanging the void. The hall is framed by vertical patterned windows, with a single large window at its extreme end. A single central bridge stands in the centre of the hall, lined with protruding structures and holographic projectors for each halo ring. These holographic representations are not current, but rather represent the state of the rings at the moment of their last update with the Ark. They are projections of the current forms of the ring, with an estimated lifespan of up to 10,000 years. An energy bridge connects the central bridge to a circular control platform, which houses the control panel for the Halo Array. When the center of the activation facility is not in use, it was parallel to the remainder of the floor. However, upon initiating the activation sequence of the array, each of the tiered segments rose to a slightly elevated platform. At the rear of the main hall, near the elevator, is a descending chute leading to the Citadel's undercarriage, which is linked to the exterior wall of the facility. On these lower levels is the main control station of the Citadel itself. 
While the main hall is responsible for the operation of the Halo Array, the control station is responsible for the systems within the facility. One of those systems is a comprehensive map of the subterranean assembly of the Citadel, and the associated sections of the Foundation's wall. This map clearly identified all details of the entire complex including the basin-like interior and the three power pylons that control the Citadel shielding. The lower levels of the Citadel include a passage connecting the Citadel to the Foundation's control station. Each Halo possesses a library, known to the Covenant as a repository of fate. The libraries are vast archive complexes and research facilities housing the collated genetic information of numerous sentient species indexed by the life workers during the conservation measure, an effort to reseed life in the galaxy following the activation of the Halo Array. Library facilities are not exclusive to the Halos and are found on several other installations as well, so again it stands to reason that the Ark has a library as well. Since the Ark is also itself a refuge for the conservation measure and would house thousands of different species, living specimens, stored specimens in silexes and even genetic material, it would be only logical that the Ark houses its own library. In the Halo libraries the structure also houses the activation index, the object used to activate the Halo ring and simultaneously initiate the repopulation process of the species archived in the library. The index has numerous secondary and tertiary functions including independently initiating the repopulation process without activating the Halo itself, as well as disabling security systems, safety protocols and likely dozens of other unknown functions. As the entire Halo array can be activated from the Citadel of the Ark, the activation index on the Ark either doesn't exist or doesn't activate the Halo array. If it does exist it wouldn't serve the function it does on the Halos, instead making more prominent use of the index's secondary and tertiary functions. The vast majority of the library structure are expansive archive rooms and silex vaults, the vast majority of which has never been seen directly by any UNSC or loyal Sangheili forces, but can likely all be accessed directly via the library's central hall. It is entirely possible the large energy oscillating panels that line the walls of the chambers that surround the library's central chamber are slipspace stasis translocation portals that when activated and access is granted allows an individual to move through to the respective catalog chambers and silex vaults. Many of these chambers are seemingly tended to by sentinels, likely hinting towards the idea that many of these chambers cannot be traversed easily by an individual on foot. Located at the heart of the library is a multi-tiered hall known as the Index Chamber, in the centre of which the activation index is suspended. In accordance with proper flood containment protocols, the reclaimer tasked with activating the installation must first deactivate an energy field surrounding the index by accessing a large elevator on the library's uppermost floor. The elevator then descends from the highest level of the library to the index's position, allowing the reclaimer to retrieve it from its container. Also, according to procedure, the reclaimer's passage through the library is assisted by the installation's monitor, whose duties include opening the facility's various security doors. Again, if the ARC doesn't require an index, even for the secondary and tertiary functions, this chamber would either serve a different purpose altogether, or again, not exist entirely. The interior of a library consists of multiple gigantic hallways of geometric design interconnected to one another, all surrounding the index chamber. Massive security doors are located between each section, other floors of the structure are accessed via large circular elevator platforms. Like most structures on foreign installations, a library also houses a network of ducts and shafts used by the sentinels or the installation's monitor to access other areas. During the flood outbreaks on installation 04 and 05, the Flood were able to utilise these tunnels to move across the structure. Due to its crucial importance, the library is the first target of the Flood Parasite during an outbreak. 
as a security measure against the flood, most libraries are separated from the rest of the installation by various types of obstacles such as moats, chasms, or massive walls. Access to the library itself occurs via each installation's internal teleportation grid, or, as was the case for installation 05, with 2401 Penitent Tangent being unable to assist the individuals wishing to retrieve the index in this manner, a longer, less direct route had to be taken. Anti-gravity gondolas spanning large chasms separating the installation's quarantine zone from the library were utilised to access the library itself. The quarantine zone was encircled by a sentinel wall, a massive barrier which was protected by a containment shield and filled with numerous aggressor sentinels and enforcers. The Epitaph Tower is a cathedral-like foreigner structure that is over a mile tall, with a ceiling vaulted nearly 200 feet into the air. Epitaph has been theorised to be the memorial or grave of the foreigner AI Mendicant Bias. At the close of the Foreigner Flood War, immediately following the firing of the array, the contender-class Metarch Ancilla known as Mendicant Bias was defeated by Offensive Bias of the same classification. During Mendicant's trial and sentencing, it was ruled that Mendicant Bias's core would be buried beneath the sands of the Ark, with a single thought, atonement. There, he would stay until the Reclaimers came and inherited the mantle of responsibility. Nearby, the immense Epitaph Tower was constructed as both a tombstone for Mendicant Bias and a means to ensure this sentence was enacted and stayed. A fragment of offensive Bias remained stored within the Epitaph Tower, his holographic representation silently watching over the tower's apex. At its base, a chamber known only as a citadel can be found, not to be confused with THE citadel. The apex of this tower is very reminiscent of a church or cathedral in its layout and overall aesthetic, although the foreigner holographics are displayed throughout its interior, even down to the glass of the tower itself which appears to be alive with holographic blue foreigner text. This may in fact be some of the code of the fragment of offensive bias watching over the tower, as this same text has appeared in numerous locations on foreigner installations where it is known that Offensive Bias has been present. It is unknown if it is the voice of Offensive Bias or Mendicant Bias himself, but UNSC personnel have reported a deep, resonating voice humming an ancient song if one remains still for long enough. Sandtrap is a contained desert biome on the surface of the Ark. It is surrounded on all sides by a large wall and overwatch towers. In the centre, the partially excavated stone ruins that bear striking resemblance to those on Delta Halo and Zeta Halo can be found. The ruins themselves extend away from the centre beneath the sands to locations unknown, simply because they have yet to be exhumed from the sands. At some point during the Battle of Installation 00, the area came under the occupation of the Dural Hane, who fortified the site with landmines and at least one phantom. However, the brutes were later driven from the region and the UNSC forces, deployed from the UNSC Aegis Fate, took control of the area, utilising D-96 TC Albatross and two M313 elephants named Behemoth and Leviathan. While the UNSC was stationed here, they analysed the atmosphere of Sandtrap and showed its atmospheric composition to be carbon dioxide of 82.7%, 7.5% nitrogen, 4.7% hydrogen, and 2.5% argon, with surface composition to be carbon, silicon, sodium, titanium, nitrogen, zinc, calcium, and other trace elements. The complete lack of oxygen here should be duly noted, so it is assumed that all UNSC forces that were occupying this area required life support systems and breathing apparatus in order to operate in this area. This is just one example of a separate biome contained within a refugia. 
The ruins once again bear the metal hieroglyphic style carvings that match the fauna holographic text that is displayed at the Epitaph Tower and at numerous locations on Zeta Halo, both of which being confirmed locations offensive bias has seen significant activity. It can be deduced that this text in some way relates to offensive bias, although a full translation of these texts are still ongoing, being performed by a crack team of xenoarchaeologists, cryptographers, and language experts led by only operative codenamed Red Nomster. Guardian is an ancient fauna complex surrounded by lush, dense jungle. The multi-lever fauna structure is split into four key areas, some of these areas connect to each other with catwalks and individual class gravitic impellers, and all of these areas connect to each other at the central hub of the structure. The purpose and function of this location isn't entirely known or understood. The trees here have been tended to and are nearly as ancient as the structure itself. Similar holographics here to those on the Epitaph Tower suggest to offensive biases presence although this is yet to be confirmed. Seemingly, one location you'd expect not to find flood containment facilities would be the Ark, the final bastion of safety in the galaxy at the close of the Fauna Flood War. However, in that assumption, you'd be mistaken. Flood containment and research facilities are also standard, used by the installation's monitor to conduct research on and observe the surviving flood specimens, these are protected by sentinels and numerous other systems and obstacles to prevent outbreak. There are various types and sizes of flood research facilities. In accordance with safety protocols of the conservation measure, these research centers were almost invariably built in remote locales. Containment protocols were another integral part of the security in flood research facilities. Many flood research facilities were built on the Halo installations, including the library structures the cold storage facility below Installation 05 surface, and the lockout facility suspended in a mountainside. One facility was built in a gas mine in Threshold's atmosphere. Installation 07 was home to numerous flood research centers, and indeed, Installation 00 is known to possess flood research facilities. These facilities were originally operated by Master Builder Faber's forces and the life workers under their charge. These facilities have since been identified and quarantined by UNSC forces led by Spartan Luke, an iconic specialist in flood biology and behaviour. One known location of flood infestation and containment for research purposes is that of isolation, a small quarantined biobubble on the surface of the Ark. The area is surrounded on all sides by a large energised containment wall. This keeps the infestation within the walls, and the energized walls likely project an energy barrier amongst other isolative measures, such as time locks or zero friction walls to prevent flood biomass from being able to grow up the walls and over the top. The internal space appears to be a relatively unaffected grassy mound with a few rusted and decaying structures within. However, there is a subterranean area that is utterly infested with flood biomass. This blight land is a form of flood infestation where specialized forms are developed by flood hives that penetrate into the very soil of an area to harvest it for any signs of life and chemical building blocks. These infestations also consume any native life, sentient or otherwise in the area, and even go so far as to harvest solar radiation to continue to grow. Some facilities have their own monitors and unique types of sentinels such as line installation one through four a sprawling underground complex on an unidentified moon. Installation 05's cold storage facility also has its own type of caretaker AI suspended to a ceiling. It can be assumed that other flood research facilities are still scattered throughout the galaxy, alone or on the interior of other halo rings. Unfortunately, the research facilities were unable to find a solution other than finding that the flood was susceptible to starvation. Thus, the foreigners had to fire the halo array in order to eradicate the flood threat. Now, these facilities have either been destroyed or are uninhabited by sentient life. The entire area is guarded by nearby aggressor sentinels, ready to engage and combat the flood breach and constructor sentinels to constantly inspect the containment walls for any signs of damage that need be repaired. 
In spite of the enormous gulfs of time that have passed, this infestation has failed to spread outside of the isolation walls. The only other known location of flood on the Ark is that of the wreckage of High Charity that, bearing an immense flood hive, crash landed on its surface in 2552. High Charity itself is severely damaged, and in spite of being subject to the effects of the replacement halo, flood specimens still survive deep within the husk of the city. Though High Charity is now contained within an immense energy barrier and constantly patrolled by sentinels, it is not without risks. High Charity's quarantine has been breached before by Banished, and the infestation spilled out into the area around High Charity. As it was, this brief break in quarantine was dealt with quickly and quarantine re-established. Yet even now, the risks posed by the Flood still linger. At the heart of the Ark installation, there is a colossal manufacturing facility called the Forge, otherwise known as the Foundry, which is used to construct Halo Ring Worlds. Both Installation 00 and its older counterpart, the Ark, possessed one of these devices. As you may have noticed, the Foundry itself contains a scarred planetoid that has been extensively mined by foreign machines for either the purpose of constructing the Ark or as a potential replacement for the existing Halo system if one were to be damaged. The foundries have been a key component in both the Greater and Lesser Ark, and have a broadly similar design and function in both instances, with the primary difference being simply the sheer scale of the respective foundries. For the Greater Ark, the foundry was responsible for constructing the 12 senescent array ring worlds with the foundry measuring a total of 30,000 kilometers in diameter. However, it was utterly incapable of constructing the smaller, but altogether more powerful, Halo installations known as the Neoteric Array, designed as a stark improvement over the original rings, necessitating the construction of a second arc. The foundry on the second arc was 10,000 kilometers in diameter, and constructed the second Neoteric Array of six halo rings of the same diameter, with the seventh being that of Zeta Halo, the last known senescent installation that was reduced in size from the 30,000 to 10,000 kilometer diameter at the close of the Fauna Flood War and integrated into the Neoteric Array. The foundry at the heart of the Lesser Arc takes the form of a circular machine lining the inner surface at the center of the installation with the mineral rich moon in the middle that is mined by Retriever Sentinels to provide the raw resources needed for Assembler and Excavator Sentinels to construct new halos. The planetoid is partially obscured by a dense violet cloud, believed to be the tens of thousands of Forerunner machines moving back and forth between the planetoid and the foundry walls with their raw materials. The planetoid at the centre of the foundry was originally located within the Milky Way galaxy but was moved through slip space by the Forerunners in order to be mined. And by all appearances, this isn't the first planetoid to be moved here. There have been several previous. In late 2552, the foundry's central planetoid appeared to be approximately one third of the Earth's diameter with a diameter of roughly 4,255 kilometers. It may have once been substantially larger, since the gap in which it is located appears to be able to accommodate an object at least twice its diameter. Orange-red coloration can be observed in the fissures which dot the planetoid's surface, indicating that it may have a molten internal structure, and that as the sentinels are mining the crust, the sections of exposed core are cooling and hardening, and then in theory could also be mined. The foundry's rim is lined with multiple different biomes, including at least one snow and alpine biome hosting a clarion facility, and another desert biome hosting one of the access points to translocate from the Ark onto the surface of the halo in the forge. The foundry also generates so much heat 
that the Ark requires multiple cooling stations to keep the installation inhabitable and the machinery operating at optimum efficiency. At least two such systems span a narrow, snowy gorge. It is possible that the massive cooling systems actually cause this icy climate, although it is equally possible to be the other way around. That the cooling systems are so efficient that the presence of them causes the local appian temperature to drop considerably compared to the rest of the insulation. The actual active cooling part of this structure is the conveyor belt-like device seated beneath the large bridge that spans the gorge. This flexible metalloid structure could hypothetically operate in one of two ways. One, the belt itself feeds deep into the foundry through a heat exchanger that dumps excessive heat from the creation of the halo into it. Then as it conveys up and away from the foundry, it rises high enough in altitude and comes into contact with a snowy mountain range where the chilled waters wash over the belts, cooling them down and allowing the now chilled belts to feed back down into the foundry where the cycle begins again. In this manner, it is the environment and the inclement weather itself that the foreigners employ for cooling. However, this is remarkably crude to the point of being noteworthy given the foreigners' technological sophistication. Personally, my hypothesis rests more so on the established tropes of the respective technologies utilised by the foreigners. Given that humanity had created remarkably efficient nuclear fusion drives for their ships that use the power generated by the fusion reaction to create a laser-induced optical slurry of ions cooled to near absolute zero to cool the reactor, meaning the more power the reactor outputs, the more cooling is generated and the cooler the reactor gets, allowing it to output even more power. It stands to reason that, given the fauna's technological superiority over humanity, that they must have a much more exotic and efficient method of cooling at play than simply pouring water onto a metal. It seems much more likely that the foreigners utilize specially created energy fields to induce low energy states, giving the effect of cooling too close to absolute zero, or that they actually utilize space-time itself. Now we already know that the foreigners can and have employed time locks, and that they can effectively hold time, or in the case of the primordial, set time in fast forward, causing it to experience billions of years of time in seconds. This had the effect of artificially aging and deteriorating the physical form of the primordial until it turned into nothing but dust, forcing it to experience maximum entropy. Entropy is defined in thermodynamics as representing the unavailability of a system's thermal energy for conversion into mechanical work, often interpreted as the degree of disorder or randomness in the system. Or in simple terms, the second law of thermodynamics says that entropy always increases with time. So, with the acceleration of time, entropy itself increases. So surely, the inverse would also stand true. The deceleration of time causes entropy to decrease. Temperature itself is defined as the sum of the net amount of kinetic energy that the constituent atomic particles of a substance possesses. Atoms vibrate and move, and the more they do this, the warmer they get. If you add more energy to them, they move faster, and they get hotter. Slowing down time to a standstill means that atoms, and indeed the very fabric of space-time, slow to a point that no such energy can flow. This is the very definition of absolute zero. So in theory, if the passage of time is a whisker above a complete standstill, temperature will be reduced to just above absolute zero. Having the conveyor-like structure pass through a slipspace field that is time-locked would induce immensely rapid cooling. But having these time-locks too close to the construction of the halo would mean no work could or would be done at any great speed, necessitating that these time-lock coolers are a good distance away from the foundry. But it would also mean 
As the conveyor passes back into normal space-time, they would absorb ambient energy from the surroundings, causing a drop in the local temperature, leading to the frozen, snowy, mountainous regions we see here. This seems much more likely to me at least, although I duly note this is but a basic hypothesis and is subject to change should new law become available. The Ark, as with the Halo Array, contains advanced teleportation grids, allowing instantaneous transportation for a monitor or reclaimer to any place on the installation. Under normal circumstances, these grids cannot be accessed by the Flood, though the Gravemind was able to use that of Installation 05's by controlling 2401 Penitent Tangent. The Ark features seemingly two to three different types of teleportation systems. The first is made up of a network of translocation platforms that are physical platforms and fixed positions across its surface that can be used to translocate to any other paired translocation platform. The next is similar to the conventional teleportation grids on the Halo installations that allow translocation from any point on the arc to any other without the need for a teleporter. And the final is a physical door teleporter that is walked through as easily as stepping through a door translocating the individual to its partner door. Teleportation through a grid is typically accompanied by rings of golden light that surround the individual being teleported. A teleportation grid requires a massive amount of energy to operate. The translocation grids on the Halo installations are supported by an array of telemetry clusters, spire-like structures equipped with synchronization conduits which ensure the grid's operation at all times. Teleportation grids extend some distance away from the installation they are based on, as evidenced by the Gravemind being able to use Installation 05's grid to translocate John 117 into High Charity, which was holding position near the installation. Translocation through a teleportation grid is not completely instantaneous. A sense of immense velocity could be felt when travelling through Installation 04's grid. Though the systems merely transport its user through slip space as opposed to disassembling and then rebuilding them in another location, the uncertainty errors involved are known to cause sensations of being put back together again from a million pieces when recovering from translocation. In addition, the process typically causes feelings of nausea and disorientation on humans. Kurt051 described the feeling as if his guts had been untwisted and then dumped back into his body inside out. The Ark is equipped with drive engines spaced along its engines. In the event of an emergency, the Ark can maneuver itself to avoid damage from a collision or gently readjust its position to account for extra galactic drift. In addition to the translocation or teleportation grid, the Ark makes use of gondolas, which are anti-gravity platforms used to ferry individuals or groups over long distances that would otherwise be difficult to traverse without. Two types of gondolas have been so far noted of, the first being similar to the gondolas found on the lakes of Delta Halo and within the bowels of Zeta Halo, and the second type being similar to the library gondolas on Delta Halo. These gondolas are supported by anti-gravity tethers below and above. Elevators are commonplace throughout various fauna installations. These elevators and their control panels have a tendency to be geometric like most things of fauna design. Fauna lifts have several different methods of propulsion. How exactly they work is not always clear. Most lifts move without apparent propulsion systems at all. Some have beams of energy supporting them, such as the lifts on the Ark, and in the case of the underwater elevators on Delta Halo, it would appear to be a hybrid system. A very obvious and mechanical whir can be heard when the lift is ascending or descending in the lift shaft, but upon entering the water, the attachment couplings at each upper corner of the elevator pod articulate and evidently produce some sort of thrust, though the thrust does not disturb the water in any noticeable way, nor generate any discernible noise. Slip space portals are a method of slipstream space transition developed by the foreigners, essentially a large-scale application of slip space translocation. Slip space portals are designed to transport enormous amounts of mass between two fixed points on a continuing basis. Large constructs such as the Halo installations could be transported across interstellar distances through the use of these portals. The transition of such large objects would slow down other slip space traffic in the entire galaxy due to the build-up of an effect known as reconciliation debt. 
While designed for large-scale transit, portals have a limited transit capacity and can be strained or even destroyed if this capacity is exceeded. Portals also have a system that filters unnecessary objects such as debris, discarding them into the volume of slip space. While passage through a portal is remarkably faster than an ordinary slip space jump, portal transition is not instantaneous. For example, the passage from the Earth portal to the Ark took over three weeks. The portal constructs have unmediated slip space cores bound to them that generate stable, pre-computed slip space routes between synchronized endpoints. Due to the fact that these devices have fixed endpoints, destination flexibility is sacrificed for safety, speed, and security. Portals may be generated by groundside facilities, which vary in overall architecture, but are typically enormous, or by generator systems situated in space. Portals generated within an atmosphere are often accompanied by severe weather disturbances. Dedicated ancillas were often tasked with maintaining portals. Certain portals are designed to activate only when a specific code sequence is transmitted, or a device such as the conduit is inserted into a machine capable of generating such portals. Others, such as the one on Earth, require a key ship to function. Halo installations are capable of generating slip space portals if necessary to reach a destination. The Forerunners had a network of portals that allowed fast passage throughout their acumen. Some systems, including that of the Capitol, had portal installations that connected to multiple worlds. The Librarian used an array of portals to travel to the worlds where she collected the various species of the galaxy for indexing at the Ark. The same network was used to transport the Halo Rings. The portals in this network could only be activated by a special type of vessel known as a key ship, most of which were eventually destroyed by the Librarian in order to prevent the Flood from reaching the Ark. The generated device for one of the Librarian's portals was buried near the town of Voy on Earth and was later activated by the Covenant, who were in possession of the last known remaining key ship, known as the Fauna Dreadnought. Faber, the master builder, had a secret private portal constructed allowing transit from the vicinity of the Greater Arc to Installation 00. This portal could only be activated by inserting a specific code known only to the master builder. Transit through the portal was also distinctly more comfortable than most normal slip space portals due to the master builder's wealth and power. On Reach was a portal complex that could be used to connect to the Ark. Unlike the portal on Earth, this one remained open for as long as the local charge lasted, and could close in minutes to hours. The Forerunners had virtually abandoned the electromagnetic spectrum as a means to carry their communications, instead relying more on secure quantum entanglement. These communications were routed over proprietary encryption protocols, which could be used to track the source or destination of the communication. This allowed instant data transfer over vast distances. Offensive Bias, for example, was capable of simultaneously coordinating the deployment of the Halo Array at Installation 00 outside of the galaxy and its fleet of warships at the Maginot Line. The domain, the Forerunner's Collective Information Repository, was not usually employed for the purpose of communication due to its unreliability. It had a known propensity to alter information without explanation. However, it was still known to be used for communication on certain occasions. The Forerunners also used a form of superluminal communication involving wormholes, however these communications were significantly slower than communication via the domain or via quantum entanglement. During the Battle of Installation 05, Cortana was able to utilize Forerunner technology to send an emergency signal directly through slip space without a physical carrier, declaring codes Bandersnatch and Hydra. According to Endless Summer, the energy required to send such a transmission would have required more energy than the combined output of all UNSC assets, demonstrating the Fauna's superior grasp of energy manipulation. Valhalla is the name given to a curious gorge. Structures similar to this canyon are echoed on many Fauna installations, including the Halo Array and Shield Worlds. Buried within deep canyons, these towers are not only sheltered from off-world debris, but their positions allow them to leverage the steep environment's natural harmonics 
to amplify their signals when firing deep into space. Most scientists believe these spires, at their base function, act as communications channels, sending specific commands to remote locations. The full operation and overarching purpose of these mysterious objects, however, remains a source of speculation. Canyons like these were often reused based on the specific tastes of their creator, their function, and as a result of other semi-random variables in the chosen design template. Beacon towers are large, delta-shaped structures with a cleave down the approximate center where a beam is emitted. The beam is fired upwards. In the case of the Halo installations, they fire towards the center of the ring, and in the case of Installation 00, they simply fire up into space. Beacon towers can serve several uses. On Requiem, beacon towers are used as stations for delivering navigational data and function as part of the Shearworld's teleportation grid, featuring teleportation portals that can transport objects to various other parts of the installation. On Installation 07, the beacon towers are designed to channel, convert, and refine energy streams of virtually any type. The Halo's beacon towers assist in ring-wide communication and also aid in the activation process of the installation's primary weapon, among a multitude of other purposes. The beacon towers can be used to send superluminal messages into space, which would outwardly appear to be the primary function of the beacon towers on the Ark, used specifically to fire message superluminally back into the galaxy to the respective Halo installations. Vacuum energy is the underlying background energy that exists in space throughout the entire universe. One contribution to the vacuum energy may be from virtual particles, particle pairs throughout the universe that blink into existence and then annihilate in a time span too short to observe. Their behavior is codified in the Heisenberg's energy time uncertainty principle. The effects of vacuum energy are thought to influence the behavior of the universe on cosmological scales. In the early 21st century, humanity contemplated the theoretical possibility of using vacuum energy to create free energy machines. It was argued that due to the broken symmetry in quantum electrodynamics, free energy does not violate conservation of energy, since the laws of thermodynamics only apply to equilibrium systems. Vacuum energy orientates from the beginnings of infinite numbers of alternate realities. When harnessed for power supply, these fledgling universes are drained of energy in their infancy, resulting in their premature deaths. Virtually all foreigner technology utilized the practically infinitely available vacuum energy as a power source, making possible their myriad of technological marvels. It is important to understand at this stage that the arc has to generate immense levels of energy and amplify it to unprecedented levels in order to power its systems and be able to communicate superluminally with the halo array still seated within the galaxy. To do this, the arc has power plants located within it that generate energy using a highly advanced quantum vacuum energy generation technique. This energy is vectored through energy relay conduits throughout its superstructure to channel the immense amounts of energy required to various facilities around the installation. The nature of vacuum energy, at least in the foreigner's use of it, remains difficult to quantify. It is mused upon by the didact in this quote. As the reflective orb rotates beneath my ship, I see the outstretched, feather-like plumes of vacuum energy pylons, drawing in the potential of an infinity of alternate realities, aborting untold numbers of nascent universes to supply Requiem's power. Strange that these cosmic deaths have never before struck me as cruel and futile. All of foreigner technology has been made possible by drawing down vacuum energy. My own life, all that I know, arises out of cosmic predation. Vacuum energy is defined as being an underlying background energy that exists in space throughout the entire universe. Although not thoroughly understood, as previously mentioned, it is surmised that one possible contribution to the vacuum energy may be from virtual particle pairs that blink into existence and annihilate in time spans too short to observe, but evidently, by the didact's aforementioned observations, it suggests that the foreigner's particular form of vacuum energy actually harvests untold numbers of separate realities, basically capturing new universes as they are about to explode into their own big bangs and commence a near-timeless process of expansion, birth, and rebirth of life 
and instead effectively aborts the infantile universes and harvests them for the incredible energy they contain. Power nodes are a type of fauna structure that's part of Installation 00. Because the Ark is so self-sufficient, a lot of the Ark's power is stored in the huge underground network of power structures beneath the surface. These outside power nodes were created to give power to the Ark during repairs or emergency situations, giving whosoever controls them a constant supply of the Ark's power. One of the most extraordinary systems possessed by the Halos, and in all likelihood the Ark as well, is the ability to lock entire sections of the Ark, or if necessary, the entirety of it, into reflective slipspace stasis. This suspends these sections in time and renders them invulnerable to damage from outside, but consume an enormous amount of energy. The Ark is capable of repairing itself to some degree, replacing damaged sections of foundational material and restoring biological sections, the Ark likely possesses a similar ejection method to the Halos themselves. The newer Halos specifically are capable of safely ejecting segments due to their modular and reconfigurable construction, as long as the process is overseen by a capable enough intelligence such as a monitor. Additionally, small specifically defined parts of the Halos terrain along with the underlying foundational layers can be jettisoned into space as a precautionary measure against flood outbreaks. In time, the ecosystems of these ejected sections can be restored by the Halo's automated systems. If the Ark possessed these systems, it would allow damaged sections to be entirely voided and reskinned thereafter, although we've not seen these systems at work on the Ark. The Ark quite rightly has its own defences, and these come in the form of a plethora of different sentinel designs as well as passive and active defensive systems. Constructors are drones programmed to repair any damaged fauna structure they can find, using low-tuned energy beams similar to sentinel beams. These beams are fired from either the top half, the middle, or the bottom half of the constructor. The beams can also be used to open cryptums or lower the shields on pistons, allowing them to access the tunnel networks built within the sentinel wall. Although weak, they can harm an organism if they come into contact with it, constructors can also play the role of a security grid. When a constructor is attacked, a signal is automatically sent to sentinel launchers to begin deploying aggressors. For this reason, they can form an excellent security perimeter. With no weapon systems, the constructors rely on aggressors when threatened. Aggressor sentinels were utilised as all-purpose workers and guards on foreigner stations. Following the construction of the Halo Array, they were reconfigured to be the first line of defence against flood outbreaks and other external intruders. The mechanical nature of the aggressors makes them ideal combat units against an enemy that could convert conventional biological infantry into biomass. By deploying the aggressors en masse, the foreigners could battle the parasite without contributing to its numbers. Controlled by their own basic AI functions, as well as their installation's monitor, aggressors patrol the installation's vast terrain and network tunnels tirelessly, and attack as their protocol demands. Enforcers are a specialised sentinel variant equipped with energy shields and an array of powerful weapons. They serve as part of an installation's defence against mass flood outbreaks, and have been seen guarding key locations such as entrances to the Sentinel Wall and the Library on Installation 05. Enforcers are produced by hovering Sentinel production facilities. Enforcers have three energy shields, the larger two being split in half for their pulse beams to fire through, and the small upper shield protects the eye of the Enforcer. However, the shield only protects the front of the machine. Enforcers are armed with pulse beams and missiles. They are also equipped with large claw-like arms which are able to pick up and rip apart most vehicles. The role of the controllers is analogous to the role of the enforcers in that they are deployed to protect critical points of interest and respond to increasing levels of threat on Installation 00. The Sentinel Pulse is the primary weapon of the controller, while the Sentinel Beam is the secondary weapon used to cover its blind spot. For defensive purposes, the controller is equipped with forward-facing energy shielding. This has been described as an improvement over the shields used by the enforcers. 
000 Tragic Solitude, often simply referred to as Solitude, was a foreigner monitor that served as the caretaker of the Ark. Originally the foreigner politician Splendid Dust of Ancient Sons, the former first counsellor, willingly chose to become a monitor with the intentions of aiding the reclaimers once they arrived at the installation. However, millennia of isolation following the firing of the Halo Array and damage the Ark incurred during the Battle of Installation 00 in 2552 led to Tragic Solitude falling victim to rampancy. Solitude was originally created by the foreigners to resemble his fellow monitors. Like most monitors, Solitude resembled a spherical construct composed of metallic armatures and a single eye in its centre, blue in colour. However, over time, following the firing of the array, Tragic Solitude found the form to be unaccommodating and merged himself with the Installation 00 to become one with it. Facilitators are sometimes referred to as adjundant monitors, or sub-monitors. They are formed from the minds of living foreigners rather than being created from scratch as full artificial intelligences are, though are somewhat limited in their capabilities when compared to other Ancilla classes such as the Caradon class and Archeon class, or even full monitors. Facilitators are typically assigned specific subsystems of a given installation such as a cartographer to keep watch over. Should the installation's monitor become unfit for duty, the sub-monitor takes over and resumes their functions, albeit in a limited capacity. Sub-monitors may also serve as station attendants, rail attendants and manage other administrative and custodial functions. There is known to be at least one sub-monitor on the Ark, being the Epsilon sub-monitor, the sub-monitor of the Epsilon Resource Facility 001 on the Ark. Again, Epsilon is referenced to the Epsilon Spire, once again suggesting that there may be at least one sub-monitor for each spire, but in all likelihood there are numerous sub-monitors for subsystems of each spire. A retriever is capable of producing an artificial gravitic force that allows it to remove materials from a world's surface. Once in position above an acceptable place to harvest, the retriever deploys its blue gravitic beam towards the world's surface and begins hauling chunks of land caught in the beam into its underbelly. The mining process utilised by a retriever is noted to create a tornado-like effect as the ground is pulled into the sentinel's hold. If deemed necessary, a retriever is capable of connecting and merging with another retriever and forming a single unit. Combined retrievers somewhat resemble an average retriever though they seem to be more effective in combat and significantly more manoeuvrable. With no apparent drawbacks, a combined retriever seems to take on the benefit of both retrievers' speed and weaponry. When a retriever is threatened or attacked, the sentinels may use their gravitic beam as a dangerous and highly destructive, though cumbersome weapon. As the sentinel was not designed for combat situations, retrievers have little to no shielding. The Ark also plays host to a rare type of sentinel known as a steward sentinel. The upper section of a steward is vast and wide with two arms. Three glowing eye-like lights are installed on the front of each sentinel with two claws below it. The lower section is lined with four mechanical tentacle-like legs. The threat of the sentinel defences of Installation 03 were cause for Ivanov Station to keep a permanent complement of broadsword fighters and Mark 2551 Onaga defence cannons on hand at all times to ensure the station's defence. Assemblers are strato-sentinels in the sense that they are primarily designed and employed to construct, maintain, fabricate, transport and recondition large-scale superstructures. Assemblers typically collaborate with retrievers, harvesting resources from the retrievers to construct large structures, including halo rings. Additionally, assemblers may be employed to complete the construction of structures emerging from large-scale construction looms. Although they are not designed to engage in combat, they will temporarily suspend their primary duties in order to engage with flood forms in the case of an outbreak. Armagers are a subclassification of Sentinel designed and employed by the Faunus for use in planetary warfare. Unlike typical Sentinel designs, primarily renowned for their use of flight, Armagers are bipedal combat platforms specialising in tactical infantry engagements within enemy constructs on a planetary surface. Armagers were particularly heavily used by the Faunus in their campaigns against ancient humanity and later their genocidal war against the Flood. Armagers were used by the Faunas for the purpose of planetary warfare, storming enemy strongholds, 
and boarding and raiding enemy warships. They specialised in tactical infantry engagements and were typically deployed in support of foreigner warriors from builder security and the warrior servants. During the latter portions of the Foreigner Flood War, the remaining Armigers were tasked with the protection of valuable foreigner sites. Armigers are intelligent enough to use the environment and their surroundings to their advantage, such as knocking a giant tree down a mountain or setting a giant rock slide in motion to trample opponents. The Ark is also capable of projecting area of effect energy shields, containment fields and repulsor fields. These energy shields can be formed in any location of immediate need to help contain flood outbreaks or otherwise isolate some areas from others. On top of this, physical barriers such as walls, structures and sarcophagi can be rapidly constructed by the resident sentinels overseen by the installation's monitor, as more of a permanent containment option that won't consume disproportionate energy over time. A complex signals interference and blocking system is also part of the Ark's defences, to avoid accidental discovery and then telegraphing of the Ark's location to others of their species. The Ark can broadcast a signal that blocks all communications incoming and outgoing from the Ark's immediate area. Exactly how this is achieved without in turn creating an obviously artificial blocking signal that could be picked up and triangulated by others is still highly debated. The Z8060 particle cannons are large spherical weapons platforms that are surrounded by three curved arms that are spaced at an equidistant distance around the primary gun assembly. Z8060s are designed to project a high velocity, highly concentrated beam of positively charged ions that will vaporise any target within range. However, they are slow rotating and vulnerable to ground attacks. A direct hit from a mini-Mac in the centre beam port will vaporise the device. The Ark has been confirmed as having numerous Z8060 particle cannons amongst other weaponised countermeasures, like that of the Halos. These cannons were utilised by the crew of the Spirit of Fire to disable the banished assault carrier in orbit above the Ark. Onwards from the particle cannons, it is hotly debated as to whether the Ark possesses more of the weaponised systems that the Halos do. For example, the exterior band of the Halo installations contain a series of confidence class weapon arrays, which can be used to enforce an exclusion zone of up to one light year. The UNSC Pillar of Autumn was actually targeted as a hostile by 343 Guilty Spark using Installation 04's confidence class defense system, but was given clearance after scans revealed that humans were aboard. Whether or not the Ark has similar systems is still subject to debate. The Ark is an immense and complex extragalactic megastructure and the birthplace of the Halo Array. Its beautiful flower-like structure glistening beneath the light of a tamed star. The beautiful varied vistas and familiar yet wholeheartedly alien environments speak to something ancient within us and beckon to ancestral memories that, at our species' current state of development, we are still not quite ready to confront. Everything from the monolithic structures, to the rolling hills and mountains, speak to the power and sophistication of the Fauna Empire. And the very fact that it was built at the close of their civilization, for the purpose of cleansing and then reseeding life makes the Ark both a harbinger of death and a bastion of life. In spite of this rather exhaustive exploration of the Ark and all of its known systems and data, the Ark still holds thousands of lifetimes worth of secrets that, while elusive, are only barely hidden beneath the surface. Some mysteries are directly in front of us. The glyphs and texts that tantalize us with meaning and purpose, yet remain obscure enough to elude us. Others are buried beneath the sands and whisper in hushed tones to the sins of the past. As reclaimers, it is upon our shoulders to uncover all of the mysteries of the foreigners and their most enduring of structures. Yet it will be many years of intensive work and discovery 
until even a fraction of the tales the Ark has to give are finally revealed to us. In spite of this, we continue, and the Ark endures. Again, thank you so much to everyone for supporting the channel and liking and subscribing. It's because of all of you that this channel has grown as rapidly as it has, and to sit back and think about the idea that there are 200,000 of you out there who like my content enough to subscribe is genuinely beyond me. I actually struggle to picture what it would actually look like to have all 200,000 of you stood in front of me. I mean, it's more people than many large towns or small cities, so again, thank you to everyone for your support and joining me on this journey and sharing your time with me. It quite literally means the world to me. More content is lined up and on its way, with tons of new things planned that I hope you'll enjoy. Here's to 200k and to our future together, and as per usual, that just leaves me to say... Thanks for watching. If I could respectfully ask, if you enjoyed this video, consider hitting the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Hit this video with a like if you enjoyed, and if not, it's not a problem. And be sure to pop a comment below to throw me an idea on what you want to see next. Massive thanks to my awesome patrons, Spartan10148, the Metarch of my facility, Falcon, Prophet, Leon, Sylphia, Mikhail, and Irrefutable, the monitors of the array, Darian, Flaming Halo, Cameron, Spartan0137, The Cave Potato, Andrew, Shia, Dakota, and Ghost, my diligent sub-monitors, my fleet of Strato Sentinels, and my loyal enforcers, and all other patrons who have supported the channel and helped keep the domain operational. Huge props and recognition to Todd Morrison, Spartan137, Wesley Stuckey, and Jacob Kemp for jumping on as Tier 0 Transcentient YouTube members. You guys are epic. Shout out to John for reasons. And if you want to help support the channel and score yourself tons of perks and merch, head over to Patreon or consider becoming a YouTube member. Links, as ever, are in the description. Much love, take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain.